Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the third of nine lectures in Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's Northwest Coast Arts Lecture Series. My name is Jay Zeller, and I am a program coordinator here at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. The series will feature the work and journeys of Northwest Coast artists and put a spotlight on priority issues and topics concerning Northwest Coast arts. The series is part of SHI's goal to promote cross-cultural understanding. Nicholas, Galanin works, Nicholas Galanin's work engages contemporary culture from his perspective rooted in connection to the land. He embeds incisive observation into his work investigating intersections of culture and concept in form, image, and sound. Galanin's work embodies critical thought as vessels of knowledge culture and technology, inherently political, generous, unflinching, and poetic. His work is in numerous public and private collections and exhibited, exhibited worldwide. Galanin, apprenticed with master carvers, earned his BFA at London Guildhall University and his MFA at Massey University. He lives and works with his family in Sitka, Alaska. Today, Nicholas Galanin will discuss Architecture of Return, Escape. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in the YouTube comments section. And at the end of the lecture, we will ask him your question. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Nicholas Galanin. Goodness, Chish. Yeh yet seen you hot do a sock. Look na hadi hot city. Kagwantan yadi. Ayahat. Sheet kakwan. My name is. Yeh Yetzin, Nicholas Galanin. I am Luknahari, a child of the Kaguantan people of Sitka. Uh, I wanna thank you for having me here um, on indigenous land. Let me get this screen share going. This is um, home, this is where I live, where I was born. Chitka Kwan, Sitka, Alaska. I like to start out with some images of where I come from. <clears throat> it's such an integral part of culture and community um, and practice. It's um, a huge part of uh, everything that I do from creating work to raising a family and children. Um, I believe our relationship to land is just really important. Uh, this is a recent video. I'd like to also wish everybody a wonderful Indigenous Peoples Day every day. Um, this was a collaboration with some allies and friends um, that they invited me to be part of um, Portugal Demand's latest music video um, with Weird Al, which is incredible. My 11 year old self is um, still a disbelief over that, I suppose. But um, we talk about how land shapes us and, and our cultures um, if we listen um, and the abundance that um, we are part of and around with the you know sustenance so every year we follow the seasons um, fishing this is sockeye fishing here at readout um, with the bears they generally don't pay much mind to us as long as they're doing all the catching Obviously, if we time it right and and are in tune with the the you know these seasons in the land and the um, the ocean, we're able to harvest enough sustenance to last our families for the year in such a you know short time period. So every year we're um, smoking salmon, it's a 
something that, you know, my father had us doing as children and we continue to do so with, with my children. Um, understanding where everything comes from and, and how we uh, sit in this relationship in this space is, is uh, so important. I believe disconnect to um, environment is such a, uh, becomes a problem for through colonization and, and the um, lack of care that might happen in the form of violence towards environment when, when somebody's really disconnected to space and place. Um, so that's, off, that's, that's why I'm home and living here in Sitka. A lot of people always ask why I'm not in New York or you know, all these other spaces and I, I get to travel the world from my work, but you know, being home is really important and it's that connection. Um, living and understanding that connection with the community. So this is um, my great grandfather, George Benson um, in the center. And this is a model of the canoe that was um, carved here in Sitka and now resides at the Centennial Hall. It's probably one of uh, very few Clinkett Northern style canoes that have been carved in recent times, at least in our communities. Um, sorry, my dog. I'm gonna let him out real quick. My father, Kinda, Dave Glannon, uh, mentor, musician, jeweler, sculptor. My uncle, Will, Will Burkhart, um, Will's a mentor of mine. And, you know, I've begun working in a customary traditional apprenticeship with my uncle, um, you know, maybe around the time I was 17, 18 years old, and I've continued that relationship. Um, I've, uh, continuum is such a important part of our culture and our, our visual language and our knowledge. Um, and I am fortunate to be uh, in a place where I'm you know, holding the culture and trying to care for it and leave leave it with more than, uh, leave it with more than was there when I got here and, and not really consume it or take from it in a sense. Um, this is my children working on um, <clears throat> a project that I've got right now. I'm part of in a, a 10 foot house post. And of course, they are part of that continuum uh, and process. The, the process of sharing knowledge and practice uh, in, in our cultural art is um, a form of reclamation. It's a form of resilience. It's a form of sovereignty. It's a form of um, you know healing to continue that language and um this is the 40 foot totem uh, i was the lead carver on for um i think it was in 2018 and over in juno and douglas the uh photo here is of my cousin who's uh my apprentice um and this was the raising um, a Takuquan village that was purposefully burnt down in the 60s. Um, it's a side of history that is continual, um, that's not often talked about. And um, colonization is still happening in our communities. Um, this is a healing pole marking that village site that was 
purposely burnt down to make room and clear out families' homes for uh, Boat Harbor. Um, this is a history that is common in nation building in the US and America, everywhere. You know, we're um, indigenous communities have been actively removed from, from land and resource. And, and uh, in that removal, not only have we been removed, but you know, our children have been removed from families. Our language has been removed from our mouths, our practices, our ceremonies. Our objects have been removed from our communities, our at U, which now uh, we have to access through institutions. Oftentimes our knowledge has been removed and homogenized through academics and academia and um, our connection to land and resource also as well with our, you know, our survival and sustenance. Um, we're continually in uh, uh, battles with the subsistence laws with um, trying to prevent environmental destruction, uh, pebble mine, there's, you know, all of these things that we're continually faced with. This pole was a healing pole and the healing that I believe that um, represented in this is the process of practicing culture and continuum uh, the process of training young apprentices to um, gain the skills to become, you know, leaders and artists and speak the language for their generations. Um, There's oftentimes a myth that I've heard many times, and that's, oh, well, if we didn't have, if we didn't, uh, collect your ob your cultural at ooh, our objects and, and keep them in these dusty museum basements next to you know bones etc then your culture would be gone and and the myth in that is represented in this here which is uh, multiple generations of continuum and knowledge transfer of visual language and practice and protocol uh, activated and live it's, it's a continuance of it and it's a demonstration of it so um to me it's a high honor to be um in a um, position or role to participate in that sense so um i feel like i've been learning and training for 20 something years now to um, even have the, the opportunity and knowledge to, you know, take part in such monumental projects like this. So, um, of course, I not only had my start as a wood, wood carver, uh, but I also worked in jewelry. And I continue to, I, I believe that the two dimensional and three dimensional art forms um, are very similar in, in a lot of ways. And, and they, um, it's a very natural thing to move in and out of flat design and sculptural form um, and in this ancient visual language. Um, I went to school in London Guildhall after several apprenticeships here in Sitka, uh, I worked with um, Louis Menard. Um, of course, my father, my uncle Will Burkhart, Wayne Price, um, Jay Miller. Um, basically, was trying to get, uh, get access to as much knowledge and, and uh, ways of working and seeing as possible, and I. Uh, remember in my early sketchbooks, writing a note to myself that, you know, one of my long-term goals as an artist was to remain open and keep just an open mind. Um, and I still feel like I'm pursuing that with that mind frame. And it's like, it's, it's constant, like 
maintenance and work to um, to keep that mind frame as and keep that curiosity, uh, creative curiosity as as you move forward in the visual arts. Um, while I was in London, the uh, program there, um, which was a bachelor's in jewelry design and silversmithing, um, essentially said I couldn't bring my cultural visual art language to the curriculum. Um, of course, I didn't know how to deal with that. They said it was too literal. So they literally wouldn't let me do any type of design work from, you know, this this language. And um, I kept a sketchbook and just jumped through their hoops, um, going through their process of what they deemed acceptable for curriculum and content. And then uh, finished that program. I didn't really look back. I went on to school in, in New, Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I studied um, um, my master's in Maori visual arts. Um, the reason I mentioned that experience in London though is because I feel like it's common in our institutions. Um, we're oftentimes told that these institutions are places to go to seek further uh, experience to seek uh, more knowledge and even ideas of success, I suppose. And um, oftentimes asked to hang up our identity or culture at the door on the way in. Um, that's slowly changing. Uh, it's that mentality and mind frame though is, um, you know, echoes uh, forced assimilation. Uh, it echoes um, boarding schools um, and all of these other connections that historically um, continue in different forms today. So um, my time in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I was able to freely explore visual language surrounding culture, uh, surrounding the politics of um, engaging in, you know, larger language, larger international languages. Sorry, I'm gonna move dog out again. This piece um, that I'm gonna share with you right now is a, a, <clears throat> a work recently commissioned for um, Sea Alaska Heritage Permanent Collection. Um, it's a, the title of the work's Atu, Inside a Closed Container. Um, Atu Inside a Closed Container is a weathered bent wood box with form line design. Attached to the box face is a carved wooden safe handle and carved wooden combination dial bearing the number one and the fractions counting down to zero instead of numbers counting up by 10. Inside the box is an unaltered sea otter hide with pattern outlines drawn on the skin side. The weathered box represents a container for our culture, knowledge, and customs. That they have weathered time and continue to be carried forward, transformed into a kind of safe. The work insists on the value of cultural knowledge and practice. The sculpture bears the impulse to protect what is valuable and threatened through a colonial understanding of wealth as something restricted to a few. The combination lock of the safe handle are clearly new additions of the un of unweathered wood and represent the requirement of blood quantum as a barrier to access. The fractions on the combination dial point to the bearing to the barring of descendants from accessing ancestral knowledge, cultural practices, and rights based on fraction of certified Indian blood. Sea otter hide contained within the box has not been significantly altered in accordance with the United States wildlife, fish, and game legislation. And so under US law, 
The work cannot be owned by an individual not determined legal via Alaska Native blood quantum. The otter hide bearing pen outlines of uncut children's mitten patterns demonstrates the unfinished labor and blockage of cultural continuum forced onto indigenous culture by federally legislated blood quantum and the arbitrary nature of who and what is considered whole. Legislation around the sale of otter fur like blood quantum revolves around perceived wholeness. A hide that cannot be made whole again is considered acceptable for a non-Alaskan native sale. A person not considered a large enough fraction of a whole Alaskan native cannot continue this cultural practice. So this is um, <clears throat> known experiences of who's deemed whole, who, who's deemed, um, um, who's able to carry on cultural practice and knowledge um, based on, um, in this instance, blood quantum, which is a detract, uh, which is a detractive legislative law or law that um, essentially is a slow genocide to our community and our culture. Um, I have friends and family that have children that are not allowed to participate in these cultural practices. They're not allowed to assist in the hunts of seal or sea otter. They're not allowed to um, carry on the knowledge of, of how to process that or to work with it. Um, and it is in contradiction to other laws like the one drop rule. Um, if you're familiar with, with that idea of, um, if you, if you have one drop of African-American or black descent in your bloodlines, then you will, that will, that is often used to continue and carry on oppressive um, forms of um, systematic racism or laws in this in this in this country. So um, this is also in conversation similar to other practices um, in Aboriginal Australia. The myth or the idea that you can breed out the Aboriginal and the uh, Aboriginal community, um, all part of continued violence on indigenous, on stolen indigenous land uh, towards our communities. This is recent, uh, a recent photograph from Seattle during the Black Lives Matters anti-police brutality um, protests that had, have been taking place across the nation, uh, even internationally. This image is of Rick Williams. Uh, Rick Williams is the brother of a uh, native woodcarver, John T. Williams. Um, John T. Williams was murdered by Officer Ian Burke of the Seattle Police Department on August 30th, 2010. The woodcarver was shot four times in the back as he crossed the street. Uh, holding his wood carving knife and his carving. Um, statistically, Native Americans are at the highest risk of being killed by police officers. The precedent for this behavior has been well established through the history of the United States in which military, cavalry, and settlers were legally protected and often rewarded for mur murdering ind indigenous men, women, and children. Uh, this work's titled, My Ears Are Numb, created for John T. Williams, uh, it's a drum, uh, from the flag and then the drumstick is carved from red cedar. John T. Williams was deaf in one ear. Um, the title also refers to purposeful active amnesia and choosing not to hear these sides of uh, these realities or experiences. Um, oftentimes the communities are fighting erasure um, and This is Shadow on the Land, an excavation and bush burial. 
the work was commissioned and created for the Biennale of Sydney near in 2020. Um, I recently was um, flown to Australia to do some research and visit with communities. Um, and like Aotearoa, where I uh, lived and studied for three years, uh, like the US, um, the settler colonial history is very, uh, we've got a lot of shared similar experiences. Um, the narrative that is often upheld in um, Australia with Cook is similar to one of Columbus here, as you know, um, the white supremacist pers perspectives that are often upheld in these uh, narratives of discovery, manifest destiny, uh, the idea that the indigenous communities are fauna or um, that these lands were barren is all part of that oppressive narrative that fails to acknowledge our uh, massive depth of connection and knowledge and science um, and um, understanding of the world, the universe. Um, and it essentially is a form of erasure. Uh, in Australia, the 250th anniversary of Cook's arrival was coming up um, around the time of this Biennale. Uh, and I knew that was a, um, you know, it's a contended, contested um, holiday with, with the indigenous Aboriginal community. Um, there's a monument in uh, Hyde Park, the statue of Cook with a discovery plaque on it. Um, that discovery narrative again is purposefully choosing not to acknowledge the community, one of the oldest civilizations in the world that's like documented. Uh, I wanted to do a piece that spoke on this. And, and um, so the work is an excavation of the shadow of that statue or that monument. Um, shadow on the land an excavation and bush burial. The excavation is an archeological dig um, that will dig deep enough to bury the monument. Um, so it's a potential burial site for that statue as well. Uh, there's a large political uh, movement and, and conversation um, sweeping the world about uh, who's represented or misrepresented in these monuments and, and stories and histories and narratives of history from um, here in the US, oftentimes these Confederate or other problematic statues and monuments um, memorialize uh, individuals who committed violent atrocities, rape, murder, uh, theft, you know, all of these things towards perpetuated towards uh, our communities um, to see them upheld in these statues that honor them is um, highly problematic. So they're changing, they're coming down, right? There's new narratives that are important and being held on what is a monument who represent, who's represented in these monuments. Um, for this piece, the process of archaeology was also uh, an important layer to the work um, to use this scientific practice to contradict the discovery plaque on the statue. Uh, when you dig down in Aboriginal land, you're going to find Aboriginal history and community. And uh, so it's intentionally revealing that. Um, it's also highlighting the um, often 
problematic narratives that uphold white supremacy in archaeology and in these um, practices that continue to uh, romanticize uh, manifest destiny, romanticize um, indigenous culture, um, that continue to uphold false narratives of uh, extinction in community that we are no longer, um, and also continue to uphold narratives of authenticity and connection to culture and, and place. Um, the work is uh, also, I think it's worth noting the work that the, the monument is not here. It's not in the image. Um, the uh, simple narrative that sometimes will arise is if you take our statues, you'll take our history. We'll lose our history. And I would argue that that's not true. There's, um, there's been more in-depth uh, dialogue and conversation surrounding uh, history in, in a work like this than in this statue or monument itself. Um, this is during these recent protests, uh, you will see that the government, or the, the police show up to protect the said statue or monument. This is also common. Um, these barriers around this represent that in a sense. Um, the barriers are also barriers that you would see in, in those spaces put up to try to uh, protect the object, the monument. The irony is uh, indigenous communities oftentimes have been fighting for protection of environment, of place, and um, getting no response. Um, yet this is the response for a statue. Um, one more aspect in the title uh, is a bush burial. Um, a bush burial is a reference to a painting in Australia that I saw while I was there. It's in a, one of the museum collections and it's a um, uh, a painting by Frederick McCuban, A Bush Burial, 1890. It's fabricated and romanticized settler body embedded into land, into history and conquest. The painting is uh, this European landscape style painting, um, trying to legitimize uh, colonization. And it's a painting of the first white body being buried on Aboriginal land in Australia. So uh, this work references that work. Architecture of Return, Escape, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Deer Hyde, uh, the first in a series of Hyde paintings for guiding the escape of indigenous remains and objects and non-indigenous institutions to return to their home communities. Architecture of Return, Escape, Metropolitan Museum is a mapped escape plan for objects held in the Met in New York City. The work is a plan for wayfinding during decolonization. Oh, that's the only image I have up there. Um, requiring return, building new structures for good ways of being. Of the few objects held in display cases, many more including human remains and ceremonial objects not intended for public view are held in the museum archives. The cost and process required to travel and visit these archives limits access to cultural knowledge and inheritance for indigenous communities and continues the removal of the objects from their land and people. While institutions control the air temperature, humidity, UV exposure and, and dust, they are unable to adequately care for these objects in cultural or spiritual ways. Painting information on hides to remember and instruct has a long history in many indigenous communities, particularly for recording significant events or feats of bravery. In this series of work, the Hyde painting depict a floor plan referencing a visitor guide and architecture blueprint for the building. The objects themselves are unwilling visitors to the museum. The painting builds a route for escape and vision for re 
reunification of cultural inheritance with community. In the painting, the galleries of the museum containing indigenous American objects, along with elevators and stairs coming from the archives are marked with red dashed line leading to the exit. The exit from the museum is also an entrance for cultural at ooh, ceremonial objects imprisoned in these spaces, an entrance for return to land, community, and culture. The work serves as a reminder of the past and as a plan for a good way forward where stolen objects, human remains, and works sold under duress can return home for their own health, for the health of their communities that created them, for the health of the communities that took them. What have we become? Personal contemporary experience of continuation of attempt to remove cultural practice by institution, homogenize knowledge and disconnect, romanticize iconography in the form and medium. Uh, this series is a series I started in 2006, I believe, 2005 or four even. Uh, this is a portrait of my face, um, cut and bound from about 2000 pages of anthropological text uh, under Mount St. Elias. It's a Smithsonian three-part series. Um, I use that text uh, oftentimes. Ideas of cultural authenticity are um, upheld from a certain era of indigenous, uh, documented indigenous culture and art. Uh, the era that is heavily romanticized uh, are deemed authentic is often the post-colonial um, community that has this false idea of purity, I suppose. Um, wanted to create work that navigated this dialogue. Um, oftentimes the information in these anthropological texts are written from outside perspective. Um, and it's oftentimes homogenized cultural knowledge um, that's not valued until it goes through that homogenized process in academia and in institution and in system. The irony is our elders words um, oftentimes only have weight or meaning after that process um, to outside community. Um, except when it doesn't have value. So you look at uh, contemporary or current conversations um, in our communities, like the science uh, and the cultural knowledge of science and connection to place uh, with our herring fisheries. If you look at the, the uh, knowledge that's uh, an environmental knowledge that's um, passed on in our communities, it is completely disregarded by fish and game. Uh, it becomes myth in that sense because it serves no purpose or provides no value to um, those agendas of consumption. This is part of that process of cutting and binding those, those books. So this is 2000 pages of hand cut. Um, this is more of an artifact to the, the process and practice that didn't quite anticipate, but it became a piece on its own. Um, death by a thousand cuts, and it's really difficult to photograph, but this is a self healing mat. And if you were to hold it up and move, it's very reflective and it's kind of the contours of uh, my face. Um, and then one more, one more part of that process um, was the other side of the page. So this became an, uh, the, the portrait of face cut inside of the book now. This work also at a time for me was really important to exercise creative sovereignty uh, and demonstrate it through practice and work by creating pieces that um, engaged in dialogue that was um, relevant to my experiences now as an uh, indigenous artist and um, it was important to create work that moved from, you know, we I come from, we come from very powerful, strong, iconic 
abstract uh, visual language in our culture that, um, you know, the totemic forms, the, the materials, the, the red cedar, the um, form line. So it was really important to create work for me at a time to, that expanded beyond that and still uh, carried, you know, representation of these experiences um, that still had dialogue and, and um, in a sense, allowed for creating works that had a larger um, global visual audience, I suppose, while still carrying um, cultural context and experience. Um, and these narratives. So I'm just going to keep going. Uh, who we are, I'm going to go ahead and play on this. This is Anthropological Catalogs of Removal, Foundations to Institution. Dispossession lays groundwork for appropriation. Collection as a means of control and genocide. We belong to these objects and have memory collective stored in them. Who We Are is a video loop. Um, the video loop comes from the Burke Museum project where they went around and cataloged uh, uh, our objects, our ceremonial objects, our masks, our baskets, our weavings, our bracelets. Um, I believe it's over 35,000 objects um, from museum institutions around the world. Uh, it's a um, archival work that also puts a holds a, a reflective mirror up to um, the anthropological categorization of uh, of our ceremony, of our deep connection and lineage to place, of our healing. Uh, uh, masks and, and objects of um, it's a, about a yeah, 15 minute loop. I, so Indian children's bracelets, tourists and collectors overlook our history while consuming iconography to see only the metal and design ignoring historical information selective amnesia. These bracelets don't allow for our history to, to be ignored, honoring the resilience of survivors and generations affected by the weight of wearing them. Three separate sets of these bracelets were created and they all must remain in separate institutions. Um, the, there's one uh, set at the Alaska State Museum in Juno's collection. Um, and I believe there's one at the Portland Art Museum uh, in their collection. Uh, this work also is a reference to something that um, is experienced and continuous in our communities with not only the um, forced removal of our children and placement of them into boarding schools, um, but also the consumption of our culture and our um, the desire to only have one side of this history or story. And that's in that case, that desire would be the shiny object, the bracelet, the curio, the, the trinket, um, free from any uh, of our experiences, free from any of our needs, um, free from the processing of these histories. Uh, Accessorize yourself with these timeless beauties, hand-carved native rape whistle earrings featuring a traditional love clinket lovebird design. Rape and pillage of the land and bodies of this land has been ongoing since 1492. Violence against native women has been allowed by the refusal to allow tribal courts to try non-native individuals. Native America beadwork, rape whistle pendant, purpose is to call attention to the fact that violence against indigenous women is higher than any other group, drawing attention to our responsibility to respect and protect women in our communities, 
the work we make for ourselves is inherently different than the work we make for sale outside of our communities and reflects the difference of our realities. Your inane perspective. Our land is our life. Disregard for indigenous knowledge by settler society of the past, resistance of present society to stop use of colonial habits. The title aims at the colonial mentality of claiming ownership and erasure of indigenous culture through renaming. Clink, the clink name here translates to river with a little middle finger at the mouth. The sun never shines in it. This is a creek in Sitka out the road. And, you know, as a child, until recently, the Clinket name was nowhere to be seen or found. Um, our place names are important. Um, our place names have um, meaning and use and reason and, and um, like language, uh, there's revitalization happening and, and acknowledging uh, that these, this rich, vast, deep connection has existed and continues to still. Indian petroglyph. This is an ongoing um, series of petroglyphs and works that have been creating in various sites. Uh, the work will last long after we're gone, long after these logos and mascots have meaning, um, long after the trademarks have any use, it'll become indigenous again. Imaginary Indian, the series um, is a body of work I had went and purchased a variety of um, indigenous objects or objects with the title native art. Um, oftentimes these, these pieces were created for tourist consumption. Um, works that, like these works here were created in Indonesia um, and then would be found in you know, the streets of our tourist shops. Um, exploiting two different communities, exploiting the Indo Indonesian carvers for cheap labor and exploiting our indigenous uh, communities for uh, the misappropriation, uh, the mimicry and the theft of our objects, our language, um, all, the, all for tourist consumption. This work also um, navigates the ideas of language and definition of native art, um, and the identity of in native art, I suppose. So I have purchased carvings created by non-native native artists. Um, it questions whether indigenous art is an aesthetic or if it is actually, you know, something in continuum of who we come from ancestors, through our ancestors and that connection to that work. So. For me to paint over that work with, in this case, uh, French toile, Victor Victorian wallpaper, um, it becomes contemporary indigenous art again. The wallpaper depicts um, a series of um, families picnicking. Um, making wine, dancing um, at, in an era when our communities here on the coast were um, fighting for survival, were um, being forcefully assimilated, were our objects were being taken and removed, our land was being removed from us. Um, so it was a very big contrast there in that consumption. This is Raven and the First Immigrant, installed at the Museum of Anthropology. Chainsaw carved rough contrast to Bill Reed's work inside the museum. Raven and the First Men, an indigenous creation story. This nation, uh, Raven and the First Immigrants, a nation creation story. Uh, cut quickly by use of chainsaw, mimicry of form, abandoning the knowledge that informs the form. 
points to extent of attempts to copy indigenous art and culture, the rough copy remains outside looking in at the world. Welcome. Natural resource and space invaders. Juxtaposition of natural resources and the ways in which the land is treated by indigenous and settler ways of life. Space invaders stand in for so-called pioneers, pilgrims and prospectors, illustration of indigenous perspectives. Inert, inability to move, the wolf-like indigenous people has been damaged by colonization of this land and continues to move despite efforts to change the living and trophies. The felted wolf in the back here uh, cannot bite. It's a, uh, to me that back half of this wolf is a representation of the desire to contain our culture, to contain our knowledge, to contain our, our objects, to contain our bodies um, and our land. Um, and the front half of this to me represents the sovereignty of our culture, our resilience and our continuance. Get comfortable, assertion of presence, resilience, opposition to cultural amnesia regarding land. There's violence in complacency. The altered sign focuses the viewer on land, a reminder that the land and the people indigenous to it remain connected regardless of the discomfort. This, regardless of the discomfort, this may cause nations and communities built on colonial legacies of att attempted genocide. The work raises questions about comfort, pointing to the lack of comfort afforded to indigenous communities during the invasion of the Americas by colonial states and during the subsequent permanent settlement of the land. The title Get Comfortable addresses communities that continue to disenfranchise and disregard indigenous people, asserting the continued presence of indigenous life connected to the land. Read by indigenous communities standing next to myself, it is a reminder of presence as well of comfort gained from land, of resistance to erasure, of responsibility to land. The work also acknowledges discomfort, a reminder that indigenous communities have not been comfortable for generations, that cultural amnesia and cultural violence are maintained through the renaming of land by intervening actively. I encourage presence, resistance, and re-indigenizing our concepts of place. So I'm just going to play short clips of these videos and then I'll talk about the work. Suhedi Shugak Titan translates to we will again open this container of wisdom that's been left in our care. Uh, to me, that philosophy embedded in this two-part video piece, um, celebration of culture and the necessity of contribution over consumption. Uh, opening this container of wisdom that's been left in our care is a reference to our language, to our visual art, to our um, song and our dance and you know every every and anything that we need it to be um it's a um, testament to the resiliency to our creative sovereignty and our um it's a reminder that we hold the keys to our culture and our our um visual work that we create and engage with. Um, we're able to move as we need to move. Um, a lot of times when a, a culture is continually consumed, preyed upon or fed upon, um, 
it's hard to move freely from from those uh, from what it is that binds you and and often times even with our our recent history of you know immense change in our communities um there's a response a reactive response to hold on to things tightly and i also believe that when you hold on to something too tightly it you know it can suffocate so uh have having to understand that and it's a, a reminder that we um get to um create freely how we see fit the Beauty in some of that to me is that those that feed upon our culture, our, our, our visual language, um, can't access or can't uh, necessarily, you know, differentiates that um, from an experience or a lived or a real perspective that you're in. So I, I think it, to me, connects that to our cultural output. Um, it keeps us in the driver's seat. It's empowering. The American dream is a lie and well. American dream is a lie and well exposes the foundation of a dream built on genocide, theft, slavery, deceit, and erroneous supremacy. The dream cuts cultures with lies in the form of constructed borders, xenophobia, white supremacy, and nationalism. This work speaks to continued violence celebrated through trophy and American excess. Gold teeth and bullet claws, reminders of the quest for wealth that drove colonization and manifest destiny and the continued use of military aggression by the United States throughout the world. God complex. This is a porcelain um, sculpture of a riot gear. Um, it's a reference to that its ceramic riot gear reflects the fragility and fear of the police state. The position references the attempt at making martyrs out of those who damage our communities and murder black and brown youth by politicians and media. Title refers to the pathological belief that the police exist above the rest of us with authority to determine who lives and how. This is legacy to historic colonial violence on indigenous land. Operation Geronimo. This is a silk screen um, edition, the print. Reflection of the ways consumer culture attempts to inhabit our histories, shallow cultural voyeurism as part of consumption of culture. The print, Operation Geronimo, engages the American government's use of force and violent conflict since infancy to subjugate the rights of indigenous black and brown bodies and communities in the Americas and around the world. Simultaneously calling out the American public's eagerness to claim and inhabit indigenous space. The title references the United States continued practice of naming military equipment after indigenous nations and using Geronimo as the name for Osama bin Laden and the military action resulting in his death. Here, Operation Geronimo superimposes an American family taken from a real estate advertisement in the space of Geronimo's face. The last indigenous leader to fight the US invasion of North America is positioned as an amusement park cutout for the American families shopping for homes to peer through. A reminder to the viewer that the contemporary real estate market is a continuation of land theft, the longest running military operation in US history, transferred from military to civilian population to continue. I think it goes like this, reflects the decimation of indigenous knowledge and technology by colonization. Aggressive mining of land and culture to create capital denied sovereignty of indigenous cultures. We have fracturing communities and knowledge and continue to create. The title recognizes our efforts to arrange the fractured pieces and to work with what we have, continuation and sovereign resilience. How much time do we have? Can go a little bit longer, but not too long. Okay, I want to make sure that there's if there's anybody watching and that can answer some questions. Um, this is a performance installation piece titled White Carver. Um, White Carver's story is simple. He visited the Pacific Northwest on a cruise ship in the 1960s. He fell in love with Clinket art. Upon his return home, he purchased several books on Clinket culture. He studied ceremonial objects and forms closely. 
Eventually, White Carver took some classes and purchased some knives. Today, White Carver demonstrates, sells, and creates native art. In, in this performance installation, White Carver is attempting to recreate a yellow cedar sculpture of a male masturbation tool titled, I Love Your Culture, uh, which was carved by my indigenous hands. Portraits of past White Carvers hang in the studio acknowledging his legacy. And taking on the role of White Carver, the White Carver has no other identification or name. He's only known for his role as White Carver. I Love Your Culture, Fine Woodworking, named after the insistent claims of non-native cultural consumers to whom the work is directed as a fetish object. It immortalizes targeted desire of a single part of an otherwise ignored whole. Illustrates failure of culture to learn from love and respect women and indigenous culture. Lack of knowledge, knowledge or appreciation of land, women and indigenous culture is systematic of a larger disease of settler society. The story of us on the receiving end of the violence and the monuments to our warriors. Ruminations, relationships to culture through glass, both lens and display case. Ha Ani, celebration of subsistence and the ways we continue to live with and because of what the land provides. Indigenous resistance to environmental destruction is not terrorism. I dreamt I could fly ceramic arrows as symbols for restrictions on indigenous culture and technology by colonial rules of engagement. Rendered fragile and useless, porcelain arrows will shatter on contact. They cannot feed or defend a family or a community. We associate flight with freedom, freedom of motion to travel beyond our current limitations. This dream of flight is a dream of sovereignty for indigenous people and the challenge in pursuing sovereignty with fragile tools. We dreamt death, so caught up in our own desires and dreams, we have been deaf to our effect on the land and our relatives. Taxidermy polar bear shot in the 70s in Shishmaroff by a white sport hunter. The village, now being swallowed by a rising sea, melts into trophy form. We dreamt death is half animal, half rug, fixed in the struggle to survive in an unsustainable condition. With this title, we are all implicated in participating in the anthropocentric industrial dream that renders us deaf to our impact on all our relatives human and non-human, speaking to colonizers and colonized, to generations past and future, to humans, as an animal forgetful of our place in the world, the work speaks of losing sight and sound of what's done to us and by us, of how we are living, what is being lost through our taking. The polar bear is an iconic symbol of struggle for survival of animals and cultures who have been decimated through colonial corporate enterprises, focused on extraction from land, and the development of capital without care for the consequence. Wuhan, we, reclamation of land and space through indigenous knowledge and language. This is a clinket um, storage container, probably, you know, this is an older one, created probably in the 18 or early 1900s. And inside of the container is a pirate radio station uh, that operates and works. The pirate radio station transmits and broadcasts Clinket language lessons. Um, the reclamation of land and space through knowledge and language happens when you tune into that station and um, the language is being taught, it's being spoken, it's being heard. Things are looking native, natives looking wider. In the wake of efforts by settler culture to erase native people, two iconic images are connected to evidence the desire of contemporary settler culture to claim us in the future. The Curtis legacy. Edward Curtis traveled the Western US photographing indigenous people, not as they were living contemporary lives at the time. He dressed them in clothing and regalia, often not of their own culture, and created images that reinforced the active attempt to vanish the Indian indigenous ways of life. A non-Indigenous woman wears an Indonesian-made copy of a clinket mask. Fetish and desire for Indigenous cultures aligned with fetish and desire for female bodies.
Sege Ka'awu ghost made by a non-native ceramic artist. These masks are based on Indonesian copies of Klinkit masks covered with blue death wear patterns, removing them three times from their origination in Klinkit culture. Far removed, they are ghosts of memories contained in our cultural objects. A response to the ways our cultural objects have been stolen, mined, and copied for consumption. Kill the Indian, save the man. Kill the Indian, save the man was the official policy of the US, Canada government and the church for generations. This was justification for attempting to destroy our language and outlawing of our religious and cultural practices, forced assimilation. The work mirrors this process by carving into Indonesian copies of Klinkit masks until nothing but splintered wood chips remain. Rearranging pieces reflects ways we have had to rearrange ourselves and our communities while destroying a false impersonation of who we are. The imaginary Indian totem, evolution of culture, skeletal ghost-like objects in museums are fetishized, romanticization as colonization of culture. Attempt to disappear the indigenous into the European. The pole is an Indonesian carved replica produced for tourist industry. Both Klinka and Indonesian carvers are exploited through the removal of agency over cultural art production for tourist trade. Familiar faces. These are mono type prints, uh, process based printmaking. Um, I reference <clears throat> in this gestural um, process the memory in our DNA that um, we have and connect to when we live uh, uh, closely to the land in that relationship. And that memory is activated, um, a joy is activated through. through process of um, maybe processing salmon or um, picking berries or um, you know skinning a deer and teaching this process um, to the next generation uh, it's a type of joy that you can't necessarily uh, harness other than just letting it pass through you as it goes and these, these prints are an attempt at um, acknowledging that visually. I believe that a lot of that connection is deeply embedded into our visual language, into our um, every aspect of the culture we create. White noise, American prayer rug. White noise refers to steady droning tones used to mask or obliterate unwanted sounds an active disassociation occurring when a signal is gone or lost, titled for the sources of American political power and media who produce constant noise in support of xenophobia. The work points to whiteness as a construct used throughout the world to obliterate voices and rights of cultures regardless of complexion. Calling attention to white noise as a source of increasing intolerance and hate in the United States as politicians, media, and citizens attempt to mask and obliterate the reality of America's genocidal past and racist present. The white noise referenced is produced by a kind of whiteness based on more than complexion. The white noise is based on the capital, blind belief and faith in itself and fear of everything outside the lines it uses to enforce inclusion or exclusion. The American prayer rug is hung on a wall in place of flat screen televisions as the image accompanying the droning sound we use to distract us from our own suffering, from land, from love, from water, from connection, there's no space for prayer, only noise. How are we doing? We could we could take questions now, I guess. I don't know how long I've been speaking for. I haven't looked at the clock. It's 10 after one. Um, so if you're at a good pausing point, we have a sure. few questions. But if you have more to go. I mean, go. Uh, we can just do questions for now. I, I don't. I don't want to keep people too long. All right. So our first question was uh, way back in the beginning. Um, people are wondering where can the music videos that you were talking about can be found? Oh, uh, anywhere. You can just type in Portugal the Man Weird Al and 
could probably find it right away. Okay. Our next question is, what is your thought process while you're developing your work and what do you prioritize and why? Um, it's always different. The work inherently is, is different and um, the, the uh, it's a lot of listening, I think, a lot of um, trying to really explode perspective and, and, and um, maybe people's relationship to that perspective. Um, just a lot of distilling these ideas down to what I think is probably their, you know, most potent form and format. So, um, yeah, it changes every project. So, thank you. Um, next question is why do you think your work is resonating so strongly with people? Why do I think it is? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I don't have to like, I don't, uh, I think part of my process is to create work that's relevant to our experience. Um, I've have early on intentionally set out to create works that I believe need to happen or need to be created to further dialogue. Um, I also, oftentimes try to be inclusive in perspectives and layered in that process um, to allow for, uh, you know, lots of engagement beyond just personal or self or lone perspectives. So I think that there's, you know, there's community and everything and, and we're even in, in this engagement of work, it's in, invitation of dialogue and furthering dialogue to uh, larger communities. So. My next question is, how do you recommend someone start contributing instead of just consuming? Uh, contributions happen in a lot of ways. Depends on your position too and your, your relationship to, to place. So contribution can happen through um, for me, it happens through, you know, creating, um, what I hope is dialogue that progresses all of our community, uh, in conversation to, um, culture, to land, to environment, um, contribution can also take place in supporting, um, culture and creation of culture and artists and um, rights and indigenous rights. Uh, those are all forms of contribution. Um, contribution also happens personally through your own work and research, through your own um, desire to um, learn more and further your perceptions and perspectives and not rely on um, say in it, our, a community to do that work for you um, so yeah there's lots of lots of different ways and uh, in contrast to consumption and consumption is just taking and and consumption is continually just uh, mining and removing and excavating and um, that's I don't believe that's an indigenous value at all we we participate and leave things with, you know, more so that it can continue in that sense. So. All right. And our final question, so we've run out of time is, is there anything you haven't had a chance to share yet that you want to mention before we finish? Um, no, I, I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of anything right now. Um, we've got lots of upcoming exciting projects. So if you want to stay in the loop on that, I'm always sharing that work on uh, maybe Instagram has been a good platform for sharing process and, and 
shows and projects. We've got a new record coming out that I'm excited about. We've got a new book um, with Minor Matters being published soon. And um, yeah, so a lot of exciting things happening. Thank you very much. Gunochchish, Nicholas, for sharing your story, your knowledge, and your experiences. We have several more lectures coming up during the month of October. You can find the full schedule and topics at our website, cialaskaheritage.org, on our news page. Our next one is Thursday, October 15th, with Melissa Shaganoff and Joel Isaac discussing sustainable arts, utilizing natural resources for art at noon to 1 p.m. Alaska time. Thank you again, Nicholas Galanin, and have a good day.